those who go out there for a home. And remember who they really are. Good morning, Trinity San Diego family. We are so excited that you have joined us online today for our worship experience. Yes, yes, we hope that you've been enjoying church at home That's right. during this season. And we want you to know that as you enter into this time of worship and receiving a message from the Word of God, yeah. we want you to know that God is with you and He is for you and He wants to speak to you this morning. That's right, so like, comment, share, yeah. make sure you uh, stay connected during this time. We hope you enjoy this worship experience. Hey church fam, we are so excited that you have joined us today. We have a couple quick announcements for you. Number one, uh, if you would, text 84576, again, 84576, Trinity San Diego, all one word. It's one of the greatest ways where you can stay connected and in the know as to all that's happening here at Trinity. Also, would you follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook? As you do that, what you can do is we try to keep that as updated as possible for you so that you can be in the know as to the greatest things that are taking place right here because we have some incredible things and we have some coming a up. real exciting announcement really excited yeah. really really excited so um we have had a few parking lot church services here and i want to shout out to anyone who's been coming to those so much fun yeah we've gotten such great feedback that uh moving forward in our phased in plan yep. of regular in-person gatherings we are going to start gathering on sunday morning 10 a.m. on starting July 12th, right here. Yep, mark your calendars. Right here for Parking Lot Church at 10 a.m. So we're going to be starting our regular weekly services again. We cannot wait. We're just going to do it a little differently than what we did it before inside. Uh, we're going to have worship out here, and we're going to have the word. You can stay in your car. You can feel free to bring a tent mm -hmm. if you want, sure. um, a beach chair, um, and you can come and park. So we're going to be doing that starting July 12th. 
We cannot wait to see you. We will still continue to have our regular online gatherings though as well. For any of you who are still uh, not totally comfortable coming to in-person gatherings, those will always be available from here on out as well. Yeah, so we wanna make sure that you stay connected. It's gonna be so exciting for Parking Lot Church and make sure that if you are one of our online fam, we will make sure that we continue to keep that up. We yep. love you. Have a wonderful day. Hey, good morning, church. We are so excited that you guys are joining us here today as we get to lift up the name of Jesus in this place. So, hey, we want to welcome you for sitting down and you're standing up in your kitchen, your bedroom, or maybe you are on the road heading to Palm Springs. I don't really know. But what I do know is that you logged in on here today and you guys are ready to worship Jesus today. So, hey, if you could bow your heads, uh, close your eyes, or lift up your hands as we just go to God this morning. Father, we love you, God. God, we lift up a shout of praise in this place. We give you thanks, God. We give you glory. We give you honor and we give you praise, God. Lord, we ask as we sing, as our praises go up, Father, we ask that your spirit, that your blessing, that your Holy Ghost may come, Father, and pour down in this place, God. In our homes, Father, in our bedrooms, Father, I ask that your spirit could come and move in the ways never moved before, God. Lord, we don't want just one any ordinary Sunday, God. We want you to move in a way like you haven't moved before, for we are hungry, desperate for your presence, God. Lord, our city needs more of you. Our nation needs more of you. God, your people needs more of you, God. So let our cry rise. Come on, let a sound of revival begin to birth out from the church. Begin to come forth out of your mouth. Begin to give him praise. Begin to give him glory. If you don't know what to say, just say Say hallelujah. Just say the name of Jesus. Just give him praise. Just say the name of Jesus. The Bible says when you speak upon the name of Jesus, that darkness has to flee. That sickness has to flee. Come on, with faith inside our hearts, let's cry upon the name of Jesus here today. Oh, Father, we love you. We give you praise, Jesus. Oh, oh. Come and have your way. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, we sing it out. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Mm, Jesus, come and have your way. Home oh, inside of our hearts, Father. Inside of our homes, Jesus. Come and have your way. Come and have your way, Father. Come and speak to us here today. Come and reveal your glory in this place. Oh, Father, 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 can you hear us calling out to you, Father? Can you hear your children singing out to you? Come on, lift up your hands in this place, in your home, in your living room, wherever you are right now. Come on, begin to declare. Come and welcome the Holy Spirit into your home right now. Say, Holy Spirit, come and have your way, Lord. Come and fill the rooms with your spirit. Come and fill the room with your glory, Father. For we are hungry and desperate for you, Lord. We need your presence in here today, God. Come and meet us, Lord. Here where we are, God, standing, Father, worshiping your name. We lift up the name of Jesus. Mm, Jesus, come and have your way. Come off your hands open, sing it out. Sing, oh Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, oh Jesus, come and have your way. 
one more time. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. With open hearts we sing out. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, we prophesy. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way. Oh, Father, come and have. Oh, Jesus, come and have. Let that be your cry this morning. Let that be your cry today. Oh, Jesus, come and have your way, Father. Come and have your way inside of our hearts, Father. Come and speak to us, Father, in that fine way, in that detail, God. Come and hear the prayers that we ask when no one's around, Lord. The details of our hearts, Father, you know them. Father, we trust you and we love you, God. We give you thanks. We love you, Father.
Stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Never stop working, even when I don't see you working, even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. 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 That is who you are, Jesus. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are, Jesus. Girl and me, Jesus. Father, you're all powerful. God, you're all worthy. Lord, there's no one like you. God, we just give you praise. We just give you praise. Lord, every challenge that we face, God, you make a way. And every obstacle that we face, God, you made a way. God, I think of Paul and when he kind of goes in and talking about the trials and the tribulations that he's been through, being shipwrecked, being sick, being in prison, and all of the, 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 the trials that he went through. God. Lord, you still made a way for that man to go through and preach your word and to spread your gospel. You still made a way so he could be a light in his community. Lord, you make a way where there is no way, God. Lord, you say through all the trials that we go through, count it as joy. Count it as joy, God. So we stand here today, God, with joys in our heart, God. 
with excitement deep inside our soul, God. For we know that you are a God who makes a way where there is no way. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what is in front of me, no matter the obstacles that I am in, God, you will make a way for your will to come to pass in our life, God. It doesn't matter. It didn't matter for Paul. They had him in chains, in prison. It didn't stop him from worshiping his God and the same thing that will happen there is true today no matter what we're facing right now it won't stop us from worshiping you from declaring how good you are from declaring how worthy you are God we give you praise we give you honor God we just thank you Jesus for you making a way God you're making a way inside our hearts you're making a way inside our lives Jesus God we give you praise and we give you honor God. Lord today is communion Sunday God and we are reminded of your love and what you have done for us, God. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. praise this morning. Come on, with every hand lifted high in this place, 
Come on, we're going to sing the next part, the next bridge. You guys already know, but I want to encourage you to worship right now. Come on, let's really press in. Let's sing these words like we mean it. Come on, with everything that's inside of us, let's declare it and let's sing it. Let's believe it full of faith inside our hearts. Because there's a God, that, that a man named Jesus, who is chasing after us, who is relentless pursuing after us. Come on, let's sing it together, church. Come on. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Come on, sing it out in shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Come on, lift up your voice, sing a little louder. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No, 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 no. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Church sing, sing, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless of oh, God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night. And I could earn it, and I don't decide, and still you give yourself. with your own words right now. Declare how good he is. Declare his goodness. Declare how worthy. Come on to sing holy. Come on right now with every hand and every praise. Just lift up a praise in this place. Come on and lift up his name on high. Come on. Let's lift up the name of Jesus high in our homes. Father, we love you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, God. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. God, with our hearts with, filled with excitement for what you are doing. God, we are reminded, God, that every trials that we go through, Lord, we will count it with joy. And that you are pursuing us like no other. God, we give you thanks, Jesus. We love you, church. God bless you, in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. It is the first Sunday of the month, and traditionally what we do the first Sunday of each month is we participate in Holy Communion. It's a time where we get to remember and we get to have revelation of the goodness of God, and we get to partake in that. So where, wherever you are in your home right now, if you want to, you can uh, go get a piece of bread or you can get um, you know, some, some drink, whether that's fruit juice or even water's okay. Um, it's really not about exactly what you're partaking in, but it's about the heart and the reverence behind it. And so what I did is this is my son. What's your name? Carter. How old are you? 
Nine years old. And what grade are you going into? Fourth. Fourth grade. And so Carter is my son. And I was reading in a particular translation of scripture. It's found, you know, specifically where Paul was writing to the first Corin or the, to the Corinthian church in that first letter. And it's out of the Passion translation. And I really love something really powerful out of the Passion translation. Uh, it is talking about the significance of passing something down. You see, I brought my son here because there are things that just genetically I pass down from you know, Katie and I passed down to him as he was born. But then there are other things that we pass down to him because of, and his sister, because of trainings and teachings. And so I love what the Passion Translation says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23. It says, I have handed down to you, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He was correcting them in regards to how they partake in Holy Communion. It says, I have handed down to you which uh, what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. And the same night in which he was handed over, he took bread and he had given thanks and he distributed it to his disciples. And he said, take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so there are things that I pass down to my son like Paul passes down to the church. There are things that create greater role, a greater significance that have impact for eternity. And so Carter and I spent some time talking about the significance of Holy Communion and how the body of, or the bread represents the body. So we're going to partake in Holy Communion together with you as I pass down this tradition to my son and just like Paul passed it down to the church and we get to partake in it together. So I'm going to hand this to my son. He's going to take a piece of, of the bread. Let's pray really quick. Jesus, thank you for your bread. Thank you for your body. Thank you for what you have passed down to us, that your body was broken for us to have forgiveness and eternal life. So thank you in your name. Amen. Let's eat together. And then it says, do you want to read this next passage? 20, verse 25? Yes. Read it right there. It says, he did... He did, he did the same with the cup of wine after and supper and said, this cup seals new covenant, coven, covenant, and covenant with, with my blood. Drink it and whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Yeah, and so there's significance in the, the blood. The blood washes us white as snow. Carter, I remember when he was baptized, he did an outward profession of something that was happening on the inward. He said that he wanted to be baptized because he wanted to make a public declaration of his faith. And when we partake in Holy Communion, what we're doing is we're actually taking inward what Jesus did on the outward. He, t he did something on the outward where his blood was spread for you and I to cover all of our sins. And so it's coming to cleanse us on the inward. That's why we ask him into our heart is to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray right now. Father, thank you for your blood that was shed for our sins. We are cleansed white as snow because of the blood. Thank you that we don't have to do anything but ask for your forgiveness and it's right there. This is a reminder of the goodness of who you are in your name. Amen. Let us partake together. Friends, I encourage you during this time to really remember, realize, and celebrate on this Freedom Weekend about the significance of the freedom that we have in Christ and that realize what you partake in and what you do, you have an opportunity to pass down not only to your kin, to the people that are with you, but also so many other people because you have influence and you have purpose. For church, I love you and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the worship experience. Hi, how are you doing today? It's Pastor Bob, and I'm so excited about sharing with you today concerning the grace of giving. My grandkids have come to be with us from Israel. They're home for a couple of months. Their parents are on furlough from the mission field, and I've been able to watch them. But it's interesting, as much as I love all my grandkids, it's fun to watch how sometimes, you know, they kind of get in little fights, and they both want the same thing at the same time, and and one's holding on to it and the other one wants it and they won't let go. And, and, and finally, you know, one wins. 
Have you ever had that experience when you have something and, and you just you just can't give it up? You just hold on to it. It takes a certain grace to let go. And that's what I want to talk to you about is the grace of giving. No matter what realm we give in, whether it be giving of our time, giving of our efforts, our talents, our giving of our treasure, it takes a certain grace to do that. When Paul wrote to the church of Corinthians in his second letter to them, he said this, We want you to know, brothers, about God's grace that was given to the churches in Macedonia. And in these next verses after that, he actually uses that word grace four times in all of those verses. And it's translated different ways from time to time. In verse 4, actually it's translated the privilege, this this act of a privilege, here's the way he puts it, he said, they begged earnestly for the privilege of participating in giving. And they, instead of using the word grace, they use the word privilege. They begged for grace. Why do they need grace? What is that about grace? It's somehow the ability suddenly to release yourself and be magnanimous, to be giving, to be gracious, to be kind, to be thoughtful, to be, to be releasing what you have to others. And then later on in verse 6, he talks about the act of grace. So we urge Titus to finish this work of kindness. Isn't that that same word kindness there is the actual Greek word for grace. So all the different ways we think about giving, it's really a letting go, it's releasing. And you have to have grace to do that. You actually have to have grace to let go. But then what happens when we let go, when we release? Then the blessing is released in our lives. You know, it's an interesting thing. I heard years ago how they catch monkeys sometimes and they want to trap them. They actually get a coconut shell. They attach it to a chain or to a rope or something like that. And then they put a hole in there and then they drop some sparkly thing in there. And so what happens is the monkey reaches into the uh, container and grabs that little sparkly thing but guess what when he goes to pull his hand out the hole is too small to have his hand and the object that he's clutching come out you know as much as they want to be free and don't want to be captured they will not let go of that thing and so they pull and pull and pull and pull because they're holding on to that precious little nugget that they value so much and people just walk up and they catch them that way the same way when we hold on, you know, we, we don't know that grace of giving. It holds us back from wonderful things that God wants to do in our life. So learn to have and ask God for the grace of giving. And I again want to thank so many of you who've been so generous to uh, Trinity Church San Diego. And especially at this time, I want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to continue in that grace of giving because we really do need that help right now. As you probably know, these are hard times for many people. And by the way, just to make note of that, as so many of you gave to a benevolence fund, we're now working on distributing those funds to people in help that need help right now. We're doing that. But I want to encourage all of you, don't forget about us. Thank you so much for continuing to give. give. And as, we, as you know, we're opening up back on campus on the 12th for our parking lot church, but we need your help to keep going. So thanks so much for having the grace of giving. On the screen right now, you can see the various ways you can give. You can text to give. There are the numbers there and the information. You can also go online to our website, or you can send your check in. But let me pray for you today. I want to just ask for God's grace to be in your life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for so many people that support the ministry of Trinity Church, and I pray today that your grace would be abundant on their life in every area that supernatural ability just to release your goodness and share it with others. Bless them today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, church. Happy 4th of July weekend. We hope that you found yourself safe during this time. My name is Pastor Todd. I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity San Diego, and I just wanted to welcome you to our worship experience. Uh, I know that it's been powerful thus far, um, but I really believe that God has laid a message on my heart specifically for you during this time. Um, we have been in a collection of talks uh, titled, What Does the Bible Say About? Uh, we've talked about racism. We've talked about family. Uh, we've talked about end times. And sure, some of these are still, uh, we, we will have you know, other types of talks that will follow this. Uh, Katie last week so brilliantly talked about what it means to be a peacemaker. And really I felt in my heart um, as I was praying and preparing for my message that we were gonna talk about what does the Bible say about anxiety? And so uh, I would encourage you, if you would, uh, wherever you're watching from, let us know where you're watching from. Let us know how we, uh, where, where we can see you're at. Maybe you wanna put your favorite comment in the chat. Shout me down a little bit. We wanna make sure that we're staying engaged uh, during this time of social distance, but we can definitely be spiritually connected. And I hope you're creating some margin in your life. Uh, margin is our word for 2020, is that we create space for God to move. The more we create space for God to move, He moves in our everyday life. And so, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Uh, this passage of Scripture today, we read of a faithful king named Jehoshaphat. Uh, say that with me, Jehoshaphat. And he ruled rightly in the eyes of God for so many years, and it all kicked, a, kicked off at the ripe age of 35. Uh, I am 38, I'll be 39 this month, so even a few years younger than I am right now. He was a ruler, he was a king, and he was following in his father's footsteps, and, and really he was following the right path, the right plan, he was doing it toward, you know, trusting in God the whole time. But still, there was a situation arose in his circumstance where he had anxiety come upon him. And, and in chapter 20, 20 specifically of Chronicles, things were going quite good for the king. But then all of a sudden, there was a turn. There was a turn for the worse. There was some sudden trouble. How many can relate to some sudden trouble? that comes on you. Maybe it was your kids that kind of went crazy or maybe they said something. Maybe your boss said something to you. Maybe you got a health diagnosis. You had something that went awry and it created a little bit of crisis in you. It created some anxiety in you. I have some encouraging news for you today that I hope you will find it truly encouraging that you will feel better at the conclusion of this message than you did right now or if you're facing anxiety and I, and I know that many are but back to this passage of scripture and so there was a sudden trouble and there were two countries which were the king's neighbors, King Jehoshaphat's neighbors and they were pressing in on different sides of him. And they came to attack Judah where King Jehoshaphat ruled. And it was really a complete surprise to him. Uh, he had informants that told him about it. And, and so he was not prepared. He only had a small army. He, was, he had no preparation to really conquer the battle. And many of us face that as well when we have anxiety. We have, we, we have something sudden come up. It's, it, it, it's something that, is, that is, uh, allows us to cause our blood pressure to raise and we get a little worried. It's, it's something appearing to be as if it is um, a reality when potentially it is not. And so here he is, he's worried. He has no military strength. These cruel neighbors were coming to attack him and these worst fears for King Jehoshaphat. Now, let me read this uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. It says, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the Minuites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already uh, in Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they, come, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And so today, uh, if you're writing notes, I encourage you to write notes, to write this down, to, to really remind yourself throughout the coming days and the coming weeks as anxiety attacks, make sure that you write some of these thoughts down to encourage you. But today the title of my message is, What Does the Bible Say About Anxiety? 
What does the Bible say about anxiety? Let's pray. And if you would, wherever you are, would you, if you feel comfortable in the confines of your home, would you just lift your hands? Would you lift your hands as we ask the Holy Spirit to help us in this time, the Holy Spirit to speak to you, the Holy Spirit to speak through me? Would you just take some, a moment and just lift your hands with me as an act of surrender, saying that God is in control, that we're going to release the next few moments to Him, and we're going to let God speak to us. So lift your hands all over wherever you are. Father, we love you. God, as we lift our hands as an act of surrender, God, we are surrendering our will, we're surrendering our mind, we're surrendering our heart to what you have for us in these moments. I pray right now that the Holy Spirit comes into spaces and places wherever we are. I pray that the Holy Spirit comforts us during this time if we are experiencing anxiety. I pray that people are encouraged by the message that's about to go forth. We love you today. In your name, amen. Uh, in preparation for this message, what I did was I um, wanted to get some information. I wanted to get a little, uh, a little perspective. And I, I went on my Facebook. Facebook uh, lately has been a hotbed of topics, a hotbed of discussion, a hotbed of airing opinions, uh, airing frustration. And I encourage you, social media is not a great way to air frustration. The Bible says in, in Matthew that we are to go to one another and we are to talk with one another if we have offense or if there's issues. And so it, Facebook is not the place to go and create a space for arguments. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to find out from my Facebook friends, what are some causes for anxiety in them? And honestly, church, it was one of the most overwhelming responses I've ever had on my Facebook since I've ever had Facebook. Uh, I don't really think I've had any more comments in certain posts than I did on this one. So what it did is it spoke to me that anxiety is real. Anxiety is real. It didn't matter if you believed in Jesus. It didn't matter if uh, which side of the political spectrum you're on. It didn't matter uh, what color your skin was. It didn't matter if you were a male or female. It did, anxiety had no merit on what type of person it is. And so I'm just going to read you a few little, a few little responses. And it says um, th that we're creating anxiety for people. Things like confusion during this crisis. There's a lot of confusion during this crisis uh, with conflicting information, with information that's going sideways, that's going one way or the other. Uh, people also said carrying the load for others, carrying the load that they're, they've been carrying the weight of maybe their children, they've been carrying the weight of their family or maybe their spouse, or maybe uh, they've been carrying the weight of past relationships or past expectations, and they're unable to really carry that load and it causes a level of anxiety to rise up in them. Uh, someone said, worried about what others think about themselves. Um, I have other people that said, uh, worried about safety, worried about finances, worried about their family and their future, worried about the tribulation, worried about the government, uh, uncertainty about the future. I had a lot of people talk about racism and uh, on both sides of it. Uh, I, I, I had too many people uh, talk about they, they have too many commitments that, that are just way heavy on them. Um, I have another, another one that said letting people down. And I'm sure whatever you've experienced in your level of anxiety, it, that, that there's a level of anxiety that you've experienced in some capacity, in some way, in some way or another in your life. And, and I really think that, that it's a critical idea and a critical concept that we understand the significance that, of, of anxiety. And as the church, we don't go quiet and talk um, talking about anxiety. We get honest. We get truthful. It's really ironic that I only had one person in all of the comments talk about COVID-19. There, there, was, there was only one comment that was about COVID-19. All the rest of them were all about other extenuating circumstances. And so in reading the response, uh, I noticed that no one is immune to anxiety. And, and as Pastor Katie and I sat down and we started talking about some of the responses uh, of people, uh, I just was so overwhelmed. And, and, and uh, she had a brilliant thought when it came to 
the whole concept of anxiety. And she, we were sitting out back on our patio just discussing uh, briefly about all of the responses. And she said this, anxiety is similar to a virus. It is no respecter of persons. Friends, anxiety for all of us, it's, it, it doesn't matter if you have a ton of money in the bank or you have no money in the bank. It doesn't matter if you have the greatest job in the world or you have no job. It doesn't matter if you're married or if you're single or if you're dating. There's anxiety around us all the time. But friends, I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you through the power of the Holy Spirit that you have hope. Maybe you don't believe in Jesus. Friends, I'm telling you, you, your anxiety will decrease when you say yes to Jesus because he is the comforter. He takes care of us. He goes in and he goes into places and spaces where we need him to visit in so many different ways, where he goes and he is the peacemaker. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. That's the Jesus that we serve. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to him, to find comfort in this time of anxiety. And so, uh, as I was doing some research, in our world, uh, researchers believe that 50% of Americans suffer with an anxiety disorder. 50%. That's of a couple, of a man and a wife, one of them will have an anxiety disorder in some capacity. That means my little family, we have four people, myself, my wife, my son, my daughter. Of the four of us, two of us will experience an anxiety disorder. Friends, I don't know about you, but we need to address this situation. We need to talk about this. We need to go and find solutions for this. And so as I was as I was just pondering the fact that 50% of Americans struggle with this, uh, it brought me back to our passage of scripture today with King Jehoshaphat. We read earlier that King Jehoshaphat in verse three had a moment of anxiety. You ever have that moment? You have that worry? All of a sudden, you get that news, you get that phone call, you get that text message. Maybe it's from your boss that you're really struggling with or that coworker that you're really struggling with. Or maybe it was from uh, someone from the past and you just see your, their name across your phone. And what it does is it sparks this initial fear and this initial worry where your heart rate elevates and you're, you're worried about what to do. You're worried about the perspective. You're worried about what's on the other side of this. I got good news that God will help you if you allow him. And I got some steps to, to do so. But one thing King Je Jehoshaphat, it says in verse 3, if you noticed it, it said alarmed. In the message translation, it says shaken. In the ESV, it says afraid. In the New Living Translation, it says terrified. In the American Standard Version, it says feared. Friends, those are all elements of anxiety. Those are all elements of worry. Those are all elements of the moment that sudden news came upon him, that he had this experience. He was alarmed. He was fearful. He was worried. And as I looked up the Hebrew word for alarmed, or I looked up that passage of scripture in the Hebrew lexicon, which is the original text, the original language, it, it means it's yer, which means to fear. So in that moment, when Jehoshaphat got the news, he, he, there was a level of fear that he had. And Jehoshaphat's emotions were real. And I want to say, so are yours. Your emotions are real. It's okay. Anxiety is not a sin. I want to repeat that to you. Anxiety is not a sin. Friends, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying and he was seeking after his father right before the crucifixion. He was in such stress and turmoil and agony. He was literally sweating drops of blood. So you can't tell me that our Savior didn't experience a little bit of alarm, anxiety, or worry in that time. And so when you think about, think about anxiety like this, anxiety is actually a normal part of life. It's a normal part of life. So take a deep breath. Just go, <sighs> anxiety is a normal part of life. And if you didn't have anxiety, friends, when you, would, you, you wouldn't look both ways before you cross the street. Let's just be real. That's one of the things that I'm always teaching my kids. You know, stop at the crosswalk, look both ways, make sure that that walking man has appeared so that you can cross from one side and no cars 
are in your way. It's a safety thing, and that creates, and, and, and so anxiety is an okay thing. It happens when you're in a situation of fight or flight. That it's, it's a level of, of emotion, and it's adrenaline that surges. However, the, thing, the problem is with anxiety is we now take anxiety and we put it in a non-life-threatening situation. We have put this, you know, what meant to be for life-threatening situations of anxiety, of the rise up of the, the, um, the whole idea of, of stress and worry. And, you know, like people are lifting cars because of their adrenaline that picks up so much because they, are, they just have this rise of emotion. And what we've done is we've taken that anxiety and we've put it back onto things like paying bills. When we get that bill in the mail, we see that and we're wondering, and we, we look at that and we put that level of anxiety on the bill. We put the level of anxiety on the rent. We put the level of anxiety on what the future will hold. We take what was meant to be for life-threatening situations and we put it into everyday life. So therefore, we now succumb to a rhythm in our life that we created a new brain pathway that the moment that that utility bill comes, the moment that rent bill, the moment the DMV shows up, the moment, the moment, the moment, we allow the anxiety to rule our heart where that's actually supposed to be meant for a life threatening situation, lifting cars off people, running when you're being attacked, things, uh, you know, things like when you're are falling that you experience that so that you can make sure that you can stay okay. You see friends, we have allowed anxiety into spaces and places where it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be in a different place. And so I, I want to really encourage you. I want to encourage you. Anxiety is not a sin. Anxiety is a signal for you to respond. I preached a message a few weeks ago about being anxious for nothing. And in that, I told you that, that, that the signal, it's like the car red light. It's not actually the, the problem. It's the signal to alert you that there is a problem. And that's what anxiety is. Anxiety is the signal letting you know that the problem is about to rise. And so how you respond in your situation, in your anxiety, is a critical component to your, if your anxiety will decrease or increase, and, and that's what we exactly learned from Jehoshaphat right here. We learn a practical, easy, truthful concept. And so rather than complain about it, you know, some people get anxiety that, that so-and-so sent them a text, and so then they go complain about it to somebody else, or they vent on Facebook, or they, they look at someone else to see how they measure up one or another. They, they, they're trying to make themselves feel better. Uh, you know, Jehoshaphat, I take, we take something from him. His, refer, his first response was to pray. He didn't call over the men initially to get the best strategy. He was alarmed. He was fearful. He was worried. So rather than going and proclaiming out what to do, and rather than going and trying to figure out other things, he went to his knees. He went to the confines of his war room. He prayed and sought the Lord out. He didn't call for his men. He called for the authority of Jesus. And so when he was alarmed, he took authority over that. Write that down. When he was alarmed, he took authority over it. He got a heavenly perspective in an earthly circumstance. And I remember this one time, my brother and I and dad were all meeting for dinner and my dad and I were sitting in the parking lot of a restaurant in Tacoma, Washington. And what was kind of interesting is this whole uh, parking lot, the way it was structured was you pulled in off the, the street there and it kind of had a rock embankment right down here and it was a slanted driveway that you had to come down and kind of around. Well, my dad and I got there pretty early and we were sitting there, we were waiting for my dad. My brother was uh, working and he was getting off work. And I remember a situation where this situation, uh, I was probably in fifth grade and I remember watching my brother in his little Toyota Celica take a left and come over and drive uh, into the parking lot. But what he thought was a perceived driveway was not a perceived driveway. It was that rock embankment of about four feet. 
And what he thought was the perceived driveway, he took his immediate left and a quick right and went up over the curb and down into the rock embankment. And his car was pinned like this with the, with the, the curb right here and the street where we were parked and the rock embankment, embankment, it was at a 45 degree angle. And here he is, and we see him do this really fast. And my dad and I are sitting in, in the other car waiting. And I immediately, it was like I had anxiety rise in me. I had adrenaline surge rise in me. I immediately went to prayer as a fifth grader because that was the only thing I knew to do. All I knew was to pray. I just knew to just go out. So what I did, my first response was to pray. And so I started praying. I started seeking God. I said, God, pray for my brother. I pray he's safe. I pray that his car's okay. And then I look over and I see my brother give us a little wave to let us know he was completely fine. You see, friends, when anxiety attacks, when anxiety is attacking you, when it is alarming you, you need to take authority over it. So when something is alarming you, how are you taking authority over it? Are you complaining? Are you letting worry rise and faith decrease? Or are you saying, in this moment, in this moment, anxiety has no grip on me. The Savior of the world is greater than my anxiety. If it's your bills, if it's your income, if it's your relationship, if it's your job, if it's your health, if it's your children, let me say this. You have to entrust the Creator. You have to entrust the God that created us, that He can take care of you and of me. And I've learned from past experiences that I have to let, when my anxiety attacks, or when my anxiety rises up, that I have to take authority over it. And so let me say it like this. When you have anxiety, anxiety is about, is about the I. Anxiety is about the I. So you see, when you spell anxiety, A-N-X-I-E-T-Y, anxiety, the letter I is in the middle. There's three letters on one side, three letters on the other, and the letter I, I would capitalize it and put you right in the middle. Because when you have anxiety, anxiety is all about the I. It's all about me. And I know that, that in some of the responses we talked about, th there are people that said, my kids, the future of our world. I know that we, it's a projection onto other things, but really it's what's causing them anxiety. It's causing us. And so anxiety is about the I. I have problems. I have worries. I have fears. I have frustrations. I have relationship issues. I have challenges. I, 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 I. Anxiety is about the I. And we need to eliminate the I and add something to the equation so it, the anxiety just doesn't rest on I or you. It, rep, it rests on God. Because if it's on your mind, it should be communicated to the one that can change the problem and that is God in heaven. And so once, once Jehoshaphat prayed, it gave him the power to take authority in his anxiety, which actually gave him the action strategy to conquer the enemy or the challenge that was in front of him. You see, friends, when you pray, you, in your anxiety, you're getting the battle strategy in how you can attack the problem that's in front of you. It's, it, you can get that battle strategy through prayer. And so what I would say is how many of our problems as humans would be eliminated if we got the action strategy through prayer? How many times would that happen? How many times if we got that action strategy? You see, when Jesus was struggling in the garden, he didn't go and talk to his friends about the issue, about what was going to take place. What did he do? He retreated into a into Gethsemane and went and prayed in a solitary place to get the action plan. We see that all throughout the scriptures where Jesus would go and he would get away to be with his father. And I can't imagine some of the things that Jesus was dealing with in the course of his 33 years on earth. Imagine some of the things that he was dealing with, but yet he knew what could happen. He knew there was power in prayer and, and he would get that, he would get the courage to even continue on. And so uh, he gets 
Jehoshaphat gets the strategy. He gets the strategy through prayer. And then he goes, and once he gets the strategy, he didn't share the anxiety. He didn't share the anxiety of the problem. He actually shared the plan in which God gave him. When he got the plan, he entrusted some people. And we're going to read about it here in a second. But he entrusted some people, some key people, which then solidified everything for him. In 2 Chronicles 20, 14 through 18. Write that down. 2 Chronicles 20, 14 through 18. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jah Jahaziel, son of Zechariah, and the son of Benaiah, and the son of Jael, and the son of Mata uh, Matanya, the Levite, and the descendant of Asphod. As he stood in the assembly, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Now, listen up. You need to listen to this. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army. Friends, don't be discouraged because of what's, your, what's facing. COVID-19, uh, there's issues because of the government. They, whatever your financial stress, do not be alarmed. Do not be worried. It says, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Just realize that. The battle is not yours, it's God's. Tomorrow, march down against them, and they will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem. He reiterates this. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face on the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped the Lord. You see, many of us are fighting battles, and I'm passionate about this, because I think that if the Christians of this world, if the followers of Jesus of this world would understand the significance of what Je King Jehoshaphat has done, of taking authority and he connects with his inner crew, his connect group, and they prayed with him and they gave him the courage. And I'm passionate about this because I believe that we're at critical moments of the church. We're at critical moments where the church needs to rise up and the way you do it is number one, we gotta do it through prayer, we gotta take authority and we gotta come together. Less division and more unity. And so here he is. They, they, the, uh, many of them are fighting battles, and the Lord is meant for, for, to fight the battle. Exodus 14, 14. You need not fight. You need only to be still. You need to be still and trust that God is in control, that he can fight the battle. And I believe that we have people in our corners. That, that's the significance of a connect group. When you have people in your corner, when you have people there with you, when they're praying for you, when you're saying, my anxiety is too heavy, my, the health issues are too great, my family is struggling, my job is outrageous, you have no idea, my lack of job. You have people in your corner, they can pray, they can encourage you, they can believe, they can trust, they can declare the goodness over God. And that's why I think that it's so important for connect groups and, community, and being in community is so vital. Because we can gain authority over things when we are anxious, the things that we are anxious about, which allows the Spirit of God to enter the situation. And so when we allow God to move in His timing, you know, recently Katie and I were praying and we sought counsel from some other pastors uh, about uh, just about per some personal things that we were going through and we sought counsel and we, and we prayed with the other pastors and we prayed and we, get, we gained a level of clarity and we gained a level of authority and there are battles that you that, that we faced in those moments that when we prayed we prayed and sought the Lord for over a year and as we sought God, and as we prayed, we didn't talk about it. We didn't have to go and, and, and we, what we did was we, we went after Jesus. We sought him first. And the thing is, is he fought the battle for us and he won the battle for us. And we gained freedom because of it. And there's power when we seek after God, when we take our anxiety and anxious situations and we push them down and we let the spirit of God rise up. And so, uh, I, I really encourage you that when we allow God to move in His timing, things really begin to shift. And more, one more thing I want to add as we're getting ready to conclude, conclude here. But uh, I wanted to add this. It's not necessarily in the story, but it's a result of 
this Bible right here because this gave me the truth and the understanding in how King Jehoshaphat dealt with anxiety, being alarmed, being worried. And so I, had, I went to this scripture. So King Jehoshaphat prayed and he, he got counsel and he gained authority. But I think that there's another level that this is, this is the inspired word of God. And there are things in here that is, are meant to help us and help us through the daily life in our, in our life. And it really tells us how to deal with scripture. Scripture is the divine word of God. And when we are filled with anxiety, we need to confess the promises of God in our life. Too often, we have people battling the world, world with the wrong weapon. They're battling the world with the weapon of complaining or arguing or worrying or anxiety. They're complaining or they're frustrated or they retreat or they go into another place. And just like there's a real God in heaven, there's a real enemy that's pursuing people. They're pursuing you, they, that, that it's a fight for your soul. And the greatest weapon that you could ever use is this Bible. And you're like, oh, well, Pastor Todd, it's, I don't quite understand it. You know, I'm not a pastor. I'm, you know, I haven't studied the scripture. Friends, I'm just saying, get in it for, a, get in it. I always, I said this for a long time, a verse of the day keeps the devil away. It's just kind of a funny pun. But really the reality is, is when you get in the scripture, it gets inside of you. So when anxiety attacks, you know how to battle it. You see, this is so powerful. This is a powerful, inspired word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the, word of, for the word of God is alive and active. Friends, when you read this Bible, it's active. It is active, active, active. It will speak to circumstances and situations. If you, if you don't know where to start, email me, info at Trinity San Diego. I will help you. I will give you any resource I have. But this, this Hebrews 4.10, or 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates and even divides the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the hearts. Friends, this inspired word of God is to make us better. It's not to make us bitter, but to make us better. It goes and reveals things and it helps things so that when you are in an anxious situation, you can lean on the word of God and you can understand it. So when anxiety attacks, you lean on this. I have a little clip that I wanna show you about the significance when someone gets into the Word of God a few times a week. Let's roll this clip. There was a recent study by the Center for Bible Engagement where they pulled 40,000 uh, p- uh, general population in the U.S. from 8 to 80, and they just wanted to see how we are engaging with Scripture. Right. And they discovered something that actually became kind of the profound discovery of the entire study. It, they weren't even looking for this, and this is kind of became the highlight of the study. Right. Um, when we're in the Scripture one time a week, and that could be church on Sunday. That's pastor saying you open your Bible, we hear the message. One time a week had negligible effect on some key areas of your life. So I'll, I'm going to spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week, negligible effect. Now at three times a week, there was a blip on the map, like there was a heartbeat. Something happened, again, a heartbeat. But here was a profound discovery. When we're in the scripture four times a week, it literally spikes off the chart. You would expect that it'd be one, two, I mean, there'd be a gradual incline on the effect and impact that would have in your life, but it was literally one, two, three, four, something radically happens. Okay, you got my curiosity. To this extent. What kind of behavior is being affected? Feeling lonely drops 30%. Wow. Ang- four times a week in the four Bible. Four times a week in the Bible. Okay. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, bitterness in relationships, marriage, a relationship with your kids, and so on, drops 40%. Alcoholism drops Crazy. 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant. You know, if there was one area when I'm talking with people that, that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant. Ask them the question, how much time are you spending in the scripture? If they're in the scripture four times a week or more, it drops 60%. Wow. Viewing pornography drops 61%. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith jumps 200%. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. And then discipling others jumps 230%. That's, That's amazing right there. Wasn't that a powerful video about the significance of what scripture can bring to your life? 
I can't believe some of the statistics where they went up in certain areas in a good way and they went down in another way. I mean, that shows me that there's significance about getting in the Word. Oftentimes I would say that it's really hard to be really well nourished if I'm only eating one meal a week. So if I'm only eating a meal on Sunday, it's really hard for me to go about the rest of my week feeling fulfilled. And so there is just proof about the power of even getting into the scriptures four times a week. Imagine what that will do for your anxiety. And what I want to do is I want to encourage you maybe to have some scriptures that you have in your back pocket that you can go to when you feel anxious or you feel worried or there's a time of fear. And so uh, when I know when I'm going through a, a troubling time or when there's worry or when there's frustration or when I'm not feeling my best spiritually, when I'm not doing, uh, when, when I don't feel really, really close, uh, you know, or anxiety attacks, what I have to do is I have to quote scripture and I have to put things into my heart that I confess with my mouth so that I can believe that will propel me into the promises of God. And so I have some scriptures that I want to read to you that you can put in your back pocket for future reference. Maybe put them in your phone as a reminder once a day that you can get in that scripture. Maybe you go and you put it uh, in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth to remind you about the promises of God. Maybe you put it on your dashboard when you're driving from point A to point B. Maybe that's a, port, a source of anxiety. Maybe you're in your office and you have it right there by your phone when that phone call is going to ring. I don't know, but you need to make sure that you have some scripture in your back pocket so that when, when anxiety attacks, you can pray, you can catch authority over it and, and stand in the freedom that you have in it, and then you can quote the scripture over it. So I'm just gonna give you a few scriptures. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. Friends, I don't know about you, but that encourages me that, that we don't have to fear, we don't have to worry, we don't have to be anxious, but we have power, love, and a sound mind. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with gratitude, make your request to God. Again, prayer changes things. Matthew 6, 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Many of my Facebook friends, when they wrote in, were talking about the future. We're talking about the uncertainty of what's to come. Friends, that's encouraging. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has its own issues. Worry about today. Live in the moment. That was Jesus talking in Matthew. Joshua 1.9 says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 1 Peter 5.7, Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. John 16.33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. That's that's a warning right there, that we're going to have trouble in this world. But in Jesus, we have peace. So take heart. I have overcome the world. Hebrews 13, 6. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can men do to me? Church, when anxiety attacks, you need to pray. You need to gain authority, and you need to use the scripture as your weapon to propel you forward to the destiny that God has for you. So when those bills arise, when the trouble, troubling circumstances arise, when the job isn't going as expected, when the job hunt is not happening, and you're worried about yourself, if you're worried about failure, friends, remind yourself of those scriptures because those scriptures in that moment encouraged me even to fight another day, to go a little bit further, to fight on what's in front of us because I know the best days are in front of us. It might look bleak, but I'm telling you, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. Jesus is in, in control of that. We have this moment to take authority over the anxiety that we have right now. And so friends, if you're experiencing anxiety right now, this is what I want you to do. Maybe you have you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus. And like I said earlier in this conversation, in this collection of talks, that I was going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Maybe anxiety has overwhelmed you. Maybe depression has gripped you. Maybe worry has got to you. Friends, Jesus can help you. But what you need to do is you need to say yes. You need to invite him in. You see, Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to come and kick down your door 
what he's going to do is he's going to stand at the door and knock of, at the door of your heart. And he's just going to wait and he's going to knock and he's going to knock and he's going to knock. And this right now is the time when I believe Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and he needs to be invited in to the door of your heart so that he can reside there because we know that when you invite him in things begin to shift it's it, it, it's not overnight it's a process and we're all on this process i don't have it all together you don't have it all together no matter how long we've served Jesus, we don't have it all together. We're still trying to be more like him. But the initial step is just asking. So if that's you today, I, what I really want you to do is I just want you to say yes. Just simply say yes. And how do you do that? You do it like this. You say, dear Jesus, I've sinned. I'm not proud of it, but I admit it. Today, Lord, take my sin, take my shame, take my anxiety. I need you to help me in your name. Amen. That's all you simply have to do. And maybe you call yourself a follower of Jesus. Friend, let me encourage you. You don't have to live in an anxious state. You don't have to live in worry and fear and wondering about the future. Because Jesus has already gone before us. Many of the problems that if we pr conceive, in, that if we pray, he will con he, we will conceive the battle plan to conquer him. And some of the problems on the other side we might never even have to face because we prayed about it first. So we need to follow the action strategy, the battle plan that God has given to us. Pray, gain authority, seek the scriptures, and watch what will happen. So friends, this is my challenge to you. When anxiety attacks, do one of those three things. Pray, take authority over it, and confess scripture over it and watch how the trajectory of the peace that is inside of you will change. Peace will rise up, anxiety will go down, and great days will be had because of that. So church, I want you to know that I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm praying for you. And the greatest days are in front of us. The future is bright. God bless. Hey everyone, we hope that that message touched you through the power of the Holy Spirit that could change your life. And what we encourage you to do is one of two things. Number one, if it did encourage you or you have a testimony that you wanna to share to encourage others, email us at info at trinitysandiego.org. It's a great way where we can get the gospel message out. And number two, you can partner with us. If you text 77977 with Trinity San Diego, all one word, you and you follow the prompts, what it will do is you can uh, create the momentum to really get the gospel message, not only in our city, but in our state and in our country and in our world. You can broaden the reach through giving. Amen. And uh, another thing, the last thing that we want to draw your attention to is there are a few things coming up right. that are really crucial to be involved in and connected to, to really remain spiritually engaged yeah. during this time. We really want to stay connected with you, even though we have to be socially distant. Right. So we have a few announcements of some things that are coming up that we would love for you to put on your calendar and join us in on this coming week. Hey church fam, we are so excited that you have joined us today. We have a couple quick announcements for you. Number one, uh, if you would, text 84576, again, 84576, Trinity San Diego, all one word. It's one of the greatest ways where you can stay connected and in the know as to all that's happening here at Trinity. Also, would you follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook? As you do that, what you can do is we try to keep that as updated as possible for you so that you can be in the know as to the greatest things that are taking place right here because we have some incredible things and we have some coming a up. real exciting announcement really excited yeah. really really excited so um we have had a few parking lot church services here and i want to shout out to anyone who's been coming to those so much fun yeah we've gotten such great feedback that uh moving forward in our phased in plan yep. of regular in-person gatherings we are going to start gathering on sunday morning 10 a.m. on starting July 12th, right here. Yep, mark your calendars. Right here for Parking Lot Church at 10 a.m. So we're going to be starting our regular weekly services again. We cannot wait. We're just going to do it a little differently than what we did it before inside. Uh, we're going to have worship out here, and we're going to have the word. You can stay in your car. You can feel free to bring a tent mm -hmm. if you want, sure. um, a beach chair, um, and you can come and park. So we're going to be doing that starting July 12th. 
We cannot wait to see you. We will still continue to have our regular online gatherings though as well. For any of you who are still uh, not totally comfortable coming to in-person gatherings, those will always be available from here on out as well. Yeah, so we wanna make sure that you stay connected. It's gonna be so exciting for Parking Lot Church and make sure that if you are one of our online fam, we will make sure that we continue to keep that up. We love you, have a wonderful day.